Okay, in this section, we're going to look at a seemingly unrelated process uh, called the Poisson counting process and then show a relationship with the work we've done so far. So we're going to start with a familiar example, a continuous time Markov chain, uh, time homogeneous, as you'll see, uh, where the states are counts. So we can only count up in steps of one. And that means you can't jump from two to four. Uh, also, you can't count down. This is just the diagonal um, of your generator matrix. So yes, this, this diagram fully defines uh, the process. Um, what kind of, just as a side note, what would you use this kind of process for? Well, we've been very busy counting COVID-19 cases in South Africa. This process won't be particularly good for that because as you add more people to your count, the chances of that person infecting more people increases. Uh, the overall count, obviously. So later on in this section, we will come up with a process that's a little bit more suitable for counting something like COVID-19 cases. This kind of counting um, is only really interesting for um, something like car accidents, as we've had before, um, and for something that you want to keep a running total of, um, not something that you want to be able to count uh, down. Um, the Markov assumption is always interesting um, when it comes to counting processes. Because if you're counting up in steps of one, uh, it's very natural to make the, the mark of assumption. If you want to know what the chances of going from four, you only really need to know that you are in three to do that. Uh, you don't need to know the whole history of the process. If you are in three, you know that you've counted up until that point. So uh, the fact that the mark of process is such a, such a natural assumption to make in a counting process is not a coincidence. You'll see that it actually uh, reflects a, a much deeper underlying relationship with, um, with counting processes in general. Um, so the, first, the question here is write down uh, a Kolmogorov four differential equation. As you can see in the conditions, um, we don't actually uh, run all the way to infinity. We run all the way up until n. Um, and so if you write the Kolmogorov four differential equations properly, you'll have to make an exception for the boundary cases. So that's why we have four cases. We have um, i equal to j is this first case, but where i is not equal to n. The second case is where i is not equal to j, but j is also not equal to n. So we can also write here i is not equal to j because we dealt with that in the first case. Then we have um, a case where we deal with the boundary condition n. Uh, and then finally, we just look at all other cases, and that includes things like counting down uh, or skipping counts. So that is what the fourth case is for. So um, you should be able to uh, do these yourselves. This is just the solution to these differential equations after some simplifying. Um, but you know, I've drawn the picture for you. Um, it's up to you to, to use the four differential equation to get these answers. Great. Question two says, verify that for i between zero and n minus one, and for all j greater than i minus one, the function or the conditional probability is equal to this expression. And you'll recognize that expression as a Poisson distribution, where lambda is equal to lambda t, um, and the count is, is j minus i. This is another example of a question where they ask you to verify or show something to be true. You can go solve your differential equations here from first principles, but if that is too difficult, it's actually easier to just take the solution they gave you and plug it into both sides of the equation. If it's equal, then you've shown it. So to verify it in this case, you'd have to plug the equation they give you into the left-hand side and right-hand side of all four cases. Uh, on this slide, I've done the most difficult case for you, case two, and I've also done the easiest case for you, case four. And you can fill the gaps with three because it um, uses exactly the same principles. So the left-hand side is the derivative. Uh, so we have to find the derivative with respect to t of this expression. You'll have to use the product rule after taking out this constant. Um, and then you just want to regroup it in a way that looks familiar to, um, to this equation. 
um, they actually ask you to verify it for cases where we're not looking at the boundary cases. So actually they are not asking you to show it for three, but you would still have to show it for, um, so you'd still have to show it for one. Three doesn't account for the boundary condition there. Cool. That should be quite easy to do. Um, now we have a definition uh, and this definition is not related to Markov processes. It's also not made super clear in the notes how this definition fully defines a random process. You take this definition for granted from the notes, but it says define a random process NT where um, N is the whole numbers. Um, and we basically say the probability of, um, of counting up in one step in one time period is proportional in time to a constant lambda. And for counting to two or more cases is equal to probability zero. So here's the second time we see the definition of filtration, which I told you is not defined in the notes. So we must just be able to naively manipulate filtrations when necessary, but they'll never ask you a deep question about filtrations. Um, so this is a definition. This is a, one definition of a, of a Poisson process. Here we have two more definitions of also things called Poisson processes, but it's not yet clear that they are all the same thing. So here we say um, it's an integer valued process, as we've had before, with rate lambda if the marginal distributions have um, a Poisson distribution lambda t, and the increments are independent and stationary. So remember we said to define a random process, it's not enough to just define the marginals. You have to define enough information to calculate the whole joint distribution. It turns out that saying that they have, the process has independent increments and is stationary is enough to define the full process. Um, so this is another definition of a Poisson process. Um, notice this relationship with the question that we did here. So we started with this Markov process and we actually found out that the conditional probabilities is in fact the Poisson distribution. And that's actually the proof that those two are related to each other. An integer valued process is what's called a Poisson process if the holding times are exponentially distributed with parameter lambda um, as follows. So that is the, the count at time t plus, oh, zero plus t one plus all the way to Tn. So the amount of counts we've had until that point in time. Um, and if the holding times are exponentially distributed, we also call that a Poisson process. Okay. And, um, and that is something that we proved in an earlier section. So um, we proved that, the, well, we proved the converse. We proved that the, if a process is a, uh, Markov process, then the holding times are exponential. Here we're just defining a process where the times are, the holding times are exponential. Now, all of these definitions, definition, example 5.1, definition 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3, all four of these examples are actually equivalent. They are the same process. And the note do doesn't prove it systematically. It doesn't check. Uh, there are a couple of ways in which you could prove it. You would have to show the, uh, the, that 5.1 implies 5.2 and the converse. You'd have to show that 1.2 um, implies 1.3 and the converse, and then you'll get that 5.1 implies 5.3 and 5.3 implies 5.1. But there are many combinations in which you could do this proof. Um, it's not done uh, completely in the notes. There are little fragments of this proof, and that's all I want you to know. So we have done um, this piece in a question in the, in the slides, and this we did at an earlier point um, in, the, um, in, in, the in the slides as well. Um, the stationary and independent increment bit, um, that I think that is also um, included in the notes that says that if you have independent increments, then you have a Markov process.
Go back to theorem 1.3 and state the relationship between the Poisson distribution and the exponential distribution. So this is a question we asked right at the start. And here we now state that relationship a bit explicitly. Consider a random process that counts in increments of one and where the mark of property holds, which is a very, as we said, a very reasonable assumption to make because you're counting up in increments of one, all that matters is where you're counting from. And where the rate of counting remains the same over time, then the waiting time in each count is exponentially distributed and the marginal distribution of the process is a Poisson distribution. So both the Poisson and exponential distributions have a relationship with each other through the Markov assumption. Keep in mind that the Poisson distribution, exponential distribution is not a process, they're, in, they're standard random variables, but their relationship, or there's a deep relationship between the two if you think about a Markov process. Okay, in example 5.2, we now look at something called a birth and immigration process. And this is actually a process that epidemiologists used as one of the models um, in counting the number of COVID cases in South Africa. A, sim a, a, birth, a simple birth immigration process looks as follows. It's still a counting process and you're still counting up um, in steps of one, but the rate completely depends on the state that you're counting from. So, the, um, you, move, you count to state two with lambda, you count to state two with two lambda, three lambda, four lambda. So the one, as you're increasing, the chance of counting to the next number increases. That counts for the simple birth part. Immigration is an external, um, unchanging rate at which people are entering the system um, but not proportional, at a fixed rate, not proportional to the number of cases in the country. This is the ultimate solution to that expected value worked out. Um, this is a question I'm going to leave you to do yourself. You've got the solution there. It involves, as it does with a, a couple of our proofs, it, it involves cleverly manipulating the indices of a sigma sign. Um, so that's obviously a little bit of a theme in this course, manipulating sigma. Uh, we saw it as well uh, in, in section four, where we were manipulating our, our sigma a little bit um, uh, in our likelihood function for the two-state model. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. This comes um, from a textbook, um, and it's more about the manipulation than really under uh, the understanding of the differential equation, but you'll apply the forward uh, Kolmogorov equation, I think, at least once.